Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you particularly for coming on uh, such a lovely day when I'm sure there were other tempting things to be doing. I want to address uh, what is in a way a very simple question, but I think has a very complicated and interesting answer. And the question is this, was Bacon a decadent artist? What I mean by that is, to what extent is the concept of decadence applicable to or explored within Bacon's work? Now, I'm ultimately going to argue that this answer is in various ways uh, negative. Okay? We should say that he's not a decadent artist. And I'm going to suggest that that negative result is, in fact, of very great interest. Okay? And negative results may, of course, generally be of very great interest. Right? If I gave you a talk this morning in which I said, was Bacon a modern painter? And I concluded that no, he wasn't. That would be a provocative and interesting result. Now, decadence is a profoundly protean concept. And I want to begin with some, some relatively straightforward uh, framings before getting to the ones I think are most interesting. So first off, let me just dismiss some trivialities. So the things I'm about to talk about are not what I mean. Okay, they're not what I'm interested in. I'm just chucking them away so that we can get down to the main thing. I'm not interested in decadence as a claim about Bacon's life. Okay, generally I think uh, that kind of biographical analysis is is of little interest to me. It's as if, if if it were, I could answer the question simply by looking at hotel receipts or something rather than looking at the paintings. I'm not interested in decadence as a claim specifically about historical influences from, say, Gautier or Wiesmann or other classic decadent figures. I think there is an interesting historical story to be told there, um, but I'm not primarily going to make an art historical claim today. I'm not interested in the use of decadence as a slur. So there are authors who define decadence as purely a negative phenomenon. So sometimes they'll say, um, well, they're good the good people who we like, we'll call those aesthetes, and the bad people who we don't like, we're going to call those decadents. Okay? So I'm not interested in that kind of framing because it returns very rapidly the result that decadence is a negative thing, whereas I think it's a much more interesting phenomenon that has both negative and positive dimensions. So, question, was Bacon a decadent artist? I don't mean any of those trivial things that I initially raised. I don't care about his life. I'm not talking about historical influences from the classical decadentist group. Um, and I'm not using decadence purely as a slur. What more might I mean by the term? Well, let me give you four quick framings of decadence that have been very historically influential, but which again are not what I want to focus on. But these ones are more interesting, right? They're not as stupid as the hotel room one. They're more interesting, but I think they're also not useful here. So the first one defines decadence as stylistic miniaturization or atomism in which the parts break away from the whole and come to dominate. So this is the definition that you see in a great deal of 19th century criticism. It started, it's pioneered by a literary historian called Desiree Nisad, um, but is then taken up by uh, various people. Um, the one who you most probably know best is Nietzsche, of course. So this is a definition of decadence that Nietzsche often uses, stylistic miniaturization. Um, I have up on the screen uh, the definition by Paul Bourget. Uh, he says the book gives way to the page, the page to the paragraph, paragraph to the phrase, phrase to the word. So decadentism is the triumph of the miniature over the whole. Now, this is very influential in the period, of course, because you can run it both politically and artistically. So people who use this definition often think of democracy as decadent because they think it's the triumph of individual parts over the whole of society. I'm not going to use this definition because um, it seems just deeply inapplicable to Bacon, to me. So if you imagine, and visit your favorite image by Bacon, and imagine what it would be for the parts of that image to triumph over the whole, I find it very hard to even conceptualize the phenomenology of that, because I think the center of Bacon images is often so dominant that it's unclear what the subparts would be. So if you want to put it in Deleuzean terms, I think uh, the dominance of the figure makes it hard to see what, what the atomistic parts are that might escape its control. What are the words? in Bacon, as opposed to the sentence or the paragraph. Now, some of you may have a different intuitive reaction. You may think, oh, okay, no, no, I can see this, and be happy to talk about it. But that's why I don't want to use this definition. I find it phenomenologically hard to apply to Bacon. Second uh, model that you often see used in decadence, and particularly in political discourse, is decadence is an empirically identifiable inflection point 
of ethico-cultural decline. Okay? So, for example, um, if you look at uh, recent French elections, if you look at the far right in America at the moment, we see huge amounts of rhetoric around decadence, society is decadent. What they mean is there's some identifiable point that they normally associate um, in France with the aftermath of the um, wars in the 50s and 60s and the states with the aftermath of the 60s, at which point things went downhill, people became decadent. And of course, this is tied up often with rhetoric against um, uh, non-normative sexualities. I'm not going to talk about this because, again, it seems to me that Bacon is staggeringly uninterested in this notion of linear time in which you might pinpoint a certain moment at which society goes in one direction or another. Um, one reason he's so, well, one striking example of this is, of course, the famous discussion with Sylvester when Sylvester raises the presence of the Nazi armband or one of the figures in the crucifixion and uh, the 1965 crucifixion. And Bacon responds by saying, well, I, I didn't care it was a Nazi armband. I just wanted to put some red on the arm. Um, and that seems to be an extraordinary, just an extraordinary disregard and disinterest in, in order to do that. Okay? Because if you're interested in historical decadence, you must surely be more caring about the symbolism of introducing fascist iconography. I'm not saying he should have been, but it just suggests that this definition is not a good one to think about as well. The third one that I want to discard is decadence, the celebration of artificiality. Um, so you see this in a range of uh, contexts. We spend well this example, um, notions like dandies, dandification, um, celebration of artificiality. Again, I don't think this is a good model for Bacon. And the reason is it's very closely linked <clears throat> to a strong gap between human and animal. Okay, so I have here a, a, an example um, of this kind of thinking. It says, uh, to the dandy, the self is not an animal, but a gentleman. Instinctual reactions, passions and enthusiasms, animal and thus abominable. So this is a model of decadence where the point is to create a sharp separation between human and animal through intense cultivation and artifice. Okay. You know, everything is perfectly dressed, perfectly chosen, perfectly tended. And that seems to be very un baconian because, of course, the boundary between human and animal and bacon, I take it to be, to be very fluid. So I don't want to use that definition either. The last one that I don't want to use, you see in people like Valerie, you see in people like Ivanov, decadence is lateness, the feeling of being at the end, at the end of a tradition, at the end of a historical epoch. Okay? Um, I reference Ivanov, I reference Valerie, of course, Tony Soprano, that other great cultural figure at the end of the start of the Soprano says, you know, I came in at the end, okay? I felt that the best had passed me by by the time I started. This notion of decadence, again, I don't think is particularly interesting or applicable to Bacon, because it works well in figures such as Valerie, obviously, who are intensely, such as Tony Soprano, who are intensely, obsessively conscious of the history of the tradition they're part of, okay, and who want to reflect on how that tradition broke down, or didn't break down, or why it can't go any further. And I think Bacon is obviously profoundly contributing to and profoundly engaged with the issue of where painting should and shouldn't go, but I don't see him as being primarily interested in the tradition, the canon, um, in, for example, referencing other works. That seems to be a byproduct of what he's doing rather than a central focus on it. So I'm not going to use that definition. Now, I should say, if any of you are sitting here thinking, well, these definitions seem good to me, right? I've got things to say about them. I don't, I don't think that's wrong. OK, this is why I went through them more slowly than the silly hotel room one. I think these are interesting ideas, but I don't think they're the best ones to approach them. Okay, so what do I think are better definitions? So I think they're going to be two. So the first, I'm going to call case one. So this is the idea of decadence as aesthetic experience. And the people I have in mind here are Pater, uh, some parts of Gautier, some parts of Des Assantes. Um, and I think this is interesting because it's going to speak amongst other issues, the kind of questions we were just talking about in the Q&A for Danny's talk about objectivity and expressivism and so forth. So decadence on this definition is an aesthetics in which the function of artworks is to produce a cascade of sensations within a receptive subject. Um, and I give some quotes here from Pater, this is from Pater's work on the Renaissance. Uh, and you can see here that you have central, that he's summing up at the end, what should be the point of engaging with Renaissance art, right? And you can imagine, because the background here is, there's 
he's trying to fight against what he sees this very stuffy kind of historiography, you know, where you spend all your time worrying about exactly where some particular artist got 50 gold coins to do the artwork. And he's not interested in that. What he wants is instead an experiential analysis. He says, what you need to look at is, what is the work to me? Okay, so you forget about the, where they got 50 gold coins. What is it to me? What effect does it produce on me? Does it give me pleasure? And if so, what sort of pleasure? How is my nature modified by its presence? And this is combined in Pater and in uh, parts of Weisman, I think, as well, with a sort of sensualist epistemology. So the object is conceived of as triggering this cascade of different sensations, and the epistemic task is to focus on all these different sensations. So you get this immense kind of inner reflective self-consciousness. How can I distinguish very, 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 very precisely between the relation of sight and sound in this experience, or the sight and sound of these two very similar experiences? And of course, you also get some other classic decadentist uh, tropes coming out of this, the need to multiply experiences, right? To experience things other people haven't experienced because that's where the value does. Now, here, I think we have for the first time a genuinely tricky and interesting uh, definition to apply to Bacon. Is Bacon decadent in this sense? Is his work seen as, well seen as exploring this theme or recuperated into this tradition? Now, you may think the answer is yes. And one reason might be, of course, that he similarly, since the Sylvester interview, since his other uh, remarks, and then as it's canonicized in the Deleuze, we think of this idea of nervous shocks. Okay, we have this sensory language when we talk about Bacon of, um, uh, I get jolts, I get shocks, okay? And that sounds not a million miles from the kind of Paterian model, right? It's about what it does to me. Um, but I think, in fact, that's quite misleading. I think the answer is, very much know that Bacon is not well seen in terms of this decadent framework. Um, and I think that will have interesting implications for the relationship to the Deleuzean scheme. So let me explain. Why do I think this model one, this case one, uh, decadence as aesthetic experience, the Pater model one might call it, is not a good model for thinking about Bacon. And I don't mean just not a good model in the way that it's got nothing to do with him. I mean, you know, I might say, um, I don't know, Brownian motion is not a good model for thinking about Bacon's work because it doesn't connect to it. Or um, I don't mean that. I don't just mean there's not a connection. I mean there's an absence of a connection, a pushback against a connection that's interesting. Because, okay. of course, there's lots of things where there's just not a connection, right? You know, I could come up with all kinds of stuff that just has no, no link to what I'm talking about, and that wouldn't be very interesting. So the reason I think this is not a good model is because Bacon's epistemology seems to me so thoroughly objectivist, so thoroughly realist. And indeed, it seems very close to phenomenology in its approach. So let me give you some initial examples. So here's speaking to Sylvester. You can see this down the bottom. Um, let me see if I can highlight this. Yeah, I'm um, actually, no, sorry, let's start with one above. So Bacon here is explaining what he thinks he's doing. He says, I believe that art is recording, it's reporting. Um, and I think that in abstract art, there's nothing other than the aesthetic of the painter and his few sensations. Okay. There's never any tension in it. So he's distancing himself from abstract art in favour of a model of art as reportage or recording. Why is there no tension in abstract art? Well, because there's no object to get right. There's no independent check. If I'm an expressivist, I express myself. There's no independent target that I'm trying to approximate outside my own feelings. Hence the lack of tension. Whereas what Baker's trying to capture is the sense of needing to zero in on something that he may or may not get right. That's what I mean by objectivity here. Now, I said this seems to be very much like phenomenology, and that comes in two stages. The first is the basic idea of the phenomenologist is that we want to let, as Husserl puts it, as Heidegger puts it, let the thing show itself from itself. We want to let the thing show itself to us on its own terms. And then the trick of phenomenology is the further claim that to let things show themselves to us as they really are, we often need highly disciplined and apparently violent methods because we're so used to seeing them in a covered up or distorted manner. And I think we see both of these ideas very clearly in Bacon. So first, the phenomenologist. So this is Sylvester uh, putting forward the suggestion. Um, 
could you put it like this? You're trying to make an image of appearance that's conditioned as little as possible by accepted standards of what appearance is. And Bacon replies, yes, that's a very good way of putting it. There's a further step, the whole questioning of what appearance is. Now, this is classically phenomenological, right? We're trying to let appearance manifest as it genuinely is. But the problem is our conception of what it is to appear, what an appearance is, has been distorted. Now, how has it been distorted? Well, you've then got various stories. I mean, so in something like Heidegger, it's distorted by the everyday, by the banal, by the mundane. It's also distorted in parts of Heidegger by some notion of cowardice. People don't want to see the reality because it's too terrible. It seems to be both of those ideas are applicable to Bacon. There's also just the brute idea that capturing it is very difficult. Okay? Even if the distortion isn't very deep, simply capturing it is no easy task. And this brings me to the uh, yeah, let's go here. Let's bring you to the violence part of it. So Heidegger has a, a famous remark where, um, when he's discussing his work on Kant, someone complains at a conference, this is not really a fair interpretation of Kant, this is just this is very violent. To which Heidegger replies, well, I'm not trying to um, reproduce the sort of standard historical reading of Kant. What I'm trying to do is use necessary moments of violence to penetrate to the heart of the thing. And this combination of violence as making visible the thing itself seems to be profoundly Baconian. So this case one, decadence as that experience, gives us a way of thinking about Bacon as a phenomenologist as opposed to a decadentist, as opposed to someone who is in the market of aesthetic experience, receptivity, a focus on how I encounter things. Let me give you two two things that might support that. One is the famous shocks. Okay, So if you think of the shocks in terms of um, giving me some kind of experience, if that's the focus, you're going to run very quickly, of course, into the problem that all decadentism runs into, which is jadedness, which is that after a few shocks, it takes more and more to shock me. And gradually the shocks stop having any power at all. Okay, so This is clap repeatedly thematized in decadentism. What do you do at the end of the process when you can't be shocked by it anymore? And it seems to me that that, if you have Deleuze's model, that is where the trajectory will end up. That we will get the nervous shocks and keep getting them and eventually they won't work anymore. And that seems to be a problem. But on my model, the nervous shocks are never really what matters because the point is not to do something to me. The point is, have I correctly captured the object as it is in itself? And the nervous shocks are a kind of index of the struggle of me doing that. So when Bacon goes through a series, um, you'll forgive me for not displaying it just because it would require more IT skills than I have, but think of any successive series of Bacon pictures, I'm using heads from the 60s, but any repeated depiction of the same theme in close temporal proximity. When he paints 10 or 12 heads, one after another, it seems to me absurd to think that he's quietly sitting in his studio shocking himself again and again, kind of jolting back, stunned, because of course there were diminishing returns. By the last one, he would be not shocked at all. The point is not to give himself this strange experience. The point is that the shocks are a measure of is he honing in on the appearance. Okay. Now there is of course a complexity here which links to the discussion that was in the Q&A last time which is what exactly is the appearance, right? So the appearance is not the sitter. The appearance is not someone in a chair opposite him. And I think the ontology of what the appearance is in Bacon is very complicated. So sometimes it seems to be a kind of bundle of emotions, um, you know, exhilaration and despair fused together. And the challenge is to represent that bundle. I think that is a complex question, but I think what matters from my point of view is just that whatever the appearance is, whatever the fact is that is so brutal for Bacon, whatever that fact is, his aim is to capture it, to track it down, to approximate it. His aim is not, as in the decadentist, to generate sensations for himself. Okay. And there, there are going to be points when these two projects intersect, okay. but they're never going to be the same. So for example, if you're a phenomenologist, to take the um, reference that Danny nicely used at the end, there is a sense in which every portrait is a self-portrait because the phenomenologist is always acutely aware of themselves as encountering the thing. Where am I standing? How am I seeing it? How does that shape my engagement with it? If you want to put it in Heideggerian terms, I'm always in the hermeneutic circle, right? I'm never coming from nowhere. 
But on the other hand, the task of the phenomenologist is to capture it as it is, okay? despite the fact that I stand in a particular position as I do so. So it seems to me you have a profoundly realist ontology and in a way that's helpfully illuminated by the contrast with decadentism. It's not an expressivist approach, not um, trying to say how things make him feel, and it's not trying to give him or give us certain feelings. It's trying to record something. Okay. So let me turn now to the second um, interesting case. Uh, and I think this is interesting, again, partly because the answer is no, and partly because it helps us. So Darren, I think, very eloquently said at the start that we need to break out of the framework of, um, uh, of Deleuzeanism, and I think that's true. I mean, Deleuze is obviously a genius. The point is not to come and, and quibble about, or at least my, what I want to do is not to come and quibble about Deleuze, you know, what has or hasn't done. Deleuze is obviously a genius, but the point is, to no longer remain trapped inside the framework that is very much the framework of Deleuze, of his personality. And to do that, this decadentism, to break that, this decadentism too is useful. Or at least that's what I'm going to claim. So, case two. This is a different definition of decadence, right? Decadence is naysaying to life. So this is the particularly late Nietzsche. Okay? Now, all these definitions can overlap, okay? So if you think um, large portions of Nietzsche are usefully read as playing around with ambiguities between these different notions. So when he says Wagner is the perfect decadent, why is Wagner a decadent? Well, partly because of the naysaying, partly because of the stylistic miniaturization. So we've got different definitions. And of course, you can add in, if you want, the kind of trivial stuff about their lifestyle. So you might say, you know, I don't know whether you account Wagner as a, dec a decadent in the trivial lifestyle sense or not. That would be an interesting question. But you can imagine how the definitions might over that. But what I want to talk about um, to close is just this final single definition, decadence case two. So this is the one Nietzsche uses, particularly when he's discussing the problems with Greek culture, um, and particularly when he's discussing his own relationship with Schopenhauer. So the decadent here is someone who is unable to embrace life, and particularly unable to embrace life as a result of a lack of energy, a lack of... Um, uh, vivacity, okay. a pessimism, a certain fear. Okay. Sometimes it's framed in terms of atrophy. Okay. The decadent is withering away. And this is um, linked very closely by him to philosophical pessimism. So he talks here about the wisest men in every age have reached the conclusion, same conclusion about life, it's no good. So he's, of course, playing off his own particular reading of Socrates, in which Socrates is death when he famously says they should make a sacrifice um, to the god of healing on his behalf. Nietzsche's reading of that is Socrates is grateful to be dying because he's grateful to be cured of the disease of life. Okay. So Nietzsche has a very pessimistic reading of Socrates. So what he's now saying here is, well, look, all these great philosophers have told us, <clears throat> in some sense, that life isn't worth living. Okay, some, of, some of them have told us that directly. Some of them have cobbled together elaborate metaphysical alternatives because they don't want to be in this world. Okay, so he reads someone like Kant as inventing a fantasy world to be in, to not be in this one. And obviously that's not necessarily a very fair reading of Kant, but that's not the issue for today. What Nietzsche does in this passage, and many others like it, so I could have cited half a dozen uh, bits of Nietzsche here, is claim that this stems from decadence. Okay. That we shouldn't take this pessimism seriously, philosophically, or at least not directly. We should ask instead, what kind of person would have these thoughts? Okay. What kind of person would argue that life was not worth living? What kind of person would construct an imaginary fantasy metaphysics as an alternative? And his answer is decadence. People who are lacking in the ability to embrace the world. Now, this is very important, both for Nietzsche studies, but also for the history of decadentism, and indeed for the history of, of much of um, what you might call Western culture, because it sets up Nietzsche's own alternative project, which is we need to use art to make us love life. Okay. So you have this famous remark where he says, um, the world is justified only as an aesthetic phenomenon. You use art to valorize life, to fight decadence. And this, of course, is why the hatred for Wagner. So Wagner is a great artist who's been exposed, Nietzsche thinks, particularly in Parsifal, as secretly being a decadent, as using art, ironically, awfully, subversively, to reinforce 
decadence to reinforce Christianity. Okay, so for Nietzsche, Christians here are decadence, right? They don't want this world, they want another world. So Nietzsche comes up with this project that we need an artistic re-embracing of this world. And of course, that is going to set off another strand of decadentism, right? Because you can imagine what he says here, only as an artistic phenomenon is life bearable to us. That, of course, sounds very much like certain strands. It's another strand of decadentism. You think of something like Wilde, right? What's Wilde doing? Wilde is trying to use intense artification of things to make the world bearable, essentially. Now, the way Nietzsche sets it up then is you have this big divide between decadence and non-decadence. And decadence are essentially pessimistic, they don't believe the world, life is worth living, and non-decadence are essentially, if not optimistic, so they're not optimistic in a Kantian sense, but they embrace life. They say yes to life. So the whole of Zarathustra is about how you might say yes to life. Now, I, it seems to me that Bacon is entirely outside this dialectic, and that the fact he's outside it is interesting. So why do I say he's outside it? I say he's outside it because I don't think he's in, I don't think he's giving a positive or a negative verdict on life. I don't think he's trying to do either. I don't think he's trying to tell us it is worth living or it isn't worth living. I think he's trying to record things as they are, okay, without the evaluative component. One nice example of this, there's a, a paper by Horowitz in um, Ben's excellent book, which you can see at the back. And indeed, I'm obliged to say this notes, but there are discount codes at the back as well on those little postcards, and I urge you to order some. But there's an excellent paper by Horowitz in there where he says, um, he makes a nice remark comparing um, Bacon's discussion, Bacon's depictions of meat with other depictions of meat in the canon. And he says that what's so striking about Bacon's is the lack of pity in them. And that seems to be right. There's an absence of pity in his depiction of meat flesh or flesh meat that's alien to other people um, who are doing the same. And I see that fitting with the general point here. There's an absence of evaluation in the Baconian works. They're not saying yes to life. They're not saying no to life either. They're refusing that question. Now, that might be interesting in terms of positioning Bacon in relation to Nietzsche, but I think it's also interesting in terms of positioning Bacon in relation to Deleuze, which is also interesting then for all of us, if we um, take as a suggestion the point Darren very eloquently made at the start, which is, is it time? So I don't necessarily want to claim that you would support this, but one might support, is it time to get out of Deleuzeanism? Because this example of decadence shows a nice way in which I think Deleuze is at odds with Bacon, and it shows it by illustrating how the nervous system talk breaks down. So let me just show you this quote. So Bacon here has been talking about mortality. Okay, so he says there's an intense sense of his own mortality. Um, it's the bit where there's that lovely line about whenever he goes into a butcher, he's always surprised that it's the animal hanging there and not him. So he has this intense sense of his own mortality. He says he, whenever he, he wakes up in the morning, he's surprised he's not dead. Um, and Sylvester says, this is at the top here. Sylvester basically says, but, but, you know, you're an optimistic person. Okay, how can this be? And Bacon's reply here is, is very, very important, I think. It's one of the steps to getting out of Deleuze. So he says, oh, well, you could be optimistic and totally without hope. One's basic nature is totally without hope. And yet one's nervous system is made of optimistic stuff. It doesn't make any difference to my awareness of the shortness of existence between birth and death. And that's one thing I'm conscious of all the time. And I suppose it does come through in my paintings. Now, Deleuze does what he always does, which is, as well, you know, the nervous system is the important thing here. And what Bacon's saying is that his nervous system is optimistic. And so that feeds through into Deleuze's own kind of optimistic vitalism. A yay saying, okay. Deleuze wants to say yes to life. Okay. There's a beautiful bit in one of the very late interviews. Someone says to Deleuze, um, uh, is, uh, is everything you ever wrote, is everything you ever wrote vitalist? Um, and Deleuze says, I certainly hope so. Okay, so vitalism for us is a, an evaluative stance. Okay, it's, it's wanting to say yes. And so he reads this exa exactly as he reads all the other stuff. So the nervous system is, is optimistic. The nervous system is what really matters in Bacon. Bacon's an optimist. Bacon's along with me. It's all okay. But if you look at the passage, that's not what is happening here. Something much more interesting is happening here because here the nervous system talk breaks down. So firstly, 
Note that here, the nervous system is contrasted with one's basic nature. Okay. So for the first time, we get the idea of a basic nature, which is different from the nervous system. So all previously we've had, well, the nervous system is the important thing. And otherwise, there's just kind of windy, rational reflection that's not, not so important. But here we have another item, which is now prior to the nervous system, or at least contrasted with it, basic nature. So the basic nature is totally without hope. The nervous system is optimistic. Note also that um, the basic nature is not long-winded rational reflection. It's rather an ever-present consciousness, an awareness that he always has when he goes to sleep as soon as he wakes up, okay, which is totally without hope. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the Deleuzean attempt to claim our ah, nervous system priority, optimism priority, happy vitalism fails here because optimism is aligned to the nervous system precisely at the moment that the nervous system is displaced from its dominant position by this other thing that we haven't had previously, one's basic nature. And that basic nature is not rational reflection. It's ever present. It's present when you go to sleep. It's present when you wake up. And that is totally without hope. Now, I do not want to say that that makes Bacon a pessimist. It seems to me that he is again recording these things. He's not judging these things. And that even if one's basic nature is pessimistic, one's nervous system is optimistic, how is one to say how that balance works out? And how would you weigh those things? And how would you establish which one had priority or which was the true one or whether they merely reflected your feelings? Or, and of course, there's a whole Nietzschean project to try and do that. But it seems to me in Bacon, none of that starts to happen because we're not engaged in this dialectic. It's not about yay saying or nay saying, it's about realism. And that's why when Deleuze tries to recruit him for optimistic vitalism, he's forced to gloss over the complexities of what's happening in passages like this, where the nervous system is displaced because optimism is being displaced. Okay, so in sum, I started with this question, is he a decadent artist? Uh, we've gone through various silly definitions of decadence, and then we looked at some more interesting ones. Okay, lateness, miniaturization, um, various others. What I've tried to suggest is that to, uh, all of these are useful lenses for thinking about Bacon. Okay? I say lenses in the sense that this is a model of thought and a literary tradition and a page tradition that you can apply to Bacon and see interesting things with, or at least that's what I'm claiming. I want to set aside the thought that I started with, the lateness, um, the miniaturization and so on, uh, the cultural decline. I don't think those are relevant. But that in itself is interesting. Okay? I mean, it, the remark about the Nazi armband seems to be just so extraordinary that one could do that. That seems interesting. But then I think you have these two cases, what I call case one and case two, the Pater model and the Nietzsche model, where the answer is no. Bacon is not a decadent. And the results of that answer then tell us things. And one of the things they tell us, one of the things I hope they tell us, is to help move a little out of Deleuzeanism. So is Bacon a decadent artist? No. Great, thank you. I'm pretty optimistic about these questions. Um, who would like to go first? Ben. Uh, thanks, Sasha. That was uh, yeah, really, really fantastic stuff, um, and a nice way, I guess, of thinking of a route kind of beyond Deleuze that is it goes beyond just this kind of critique of of affect and affective formalism. Yeah. Um, it struck me that there might potentially be a way of rescuing Bacon as a kind of decadent figure, and I was reminded <coughs> of a a passage in Adorno actually, and in um, his essay on Spengler and Spengler's decline of the West yeah. um, in a, a, a collection of uh, Adorno's essays called Prisons. And I just managed to, uh, to dig out the quote while you were speaking. And Adorno says there, in a world of brutal and oppressed life, decadence becomes the refuge of a potentially better life by renouncing its allegiance to this one and to its culture. And so, although Adorno obviously never writes on Bacon specifically, I'm wondering if there is 
a kind of possibility of placing Bacon alongside figures that Adorno does write about, like Beckett, for example, uh, like Kafka, these figures who one might well call decadent, that manage to critique damaged life, wrong life, precisely by being silent about it, as Adorno might say. And maybe this is a way, I don't know what you think, of, of, of kind of rescuing Bacon, perhaps, as a kind of decadent. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I think in, in, Ador in, in the case of Adorno himself, I think it's too... It's difficult. So I think the parts of Adorno that are too quietistic and too retreatist. Sorry, no, no, everyone always says that, but in comparison to Bacon. So what I want to bring out of Bacon is a kind of intense obsession with unfailingly matching and looking at reality. Um, and I think the strands of Adorno, which are too, um, the passages about retreating to a quiet life, a modest life, which I think give up on that task of meeting the gaze of reality. Um, and I think one reason for that is because I, I, I see Adorno is, I think, hurt by the world in a way that Bacon isn't. I think Bacon is quite happy with the, you know, the challenge of trying to see it, whereas I think Adorno is pained by it in a, in a different way. So I think there's a difference between those two there. It's very interesting the comparison with, with say, Beckett or, or Kafka. I mean, and you know much more about those authors than I do. I need to think about it. I want to. I want to say again, there's a difference in the way in which they're bearing witness. So I think in Bacon, the, the witness is, is almost um, Im impossibly straightforward. It's here is the thing. And the challenge is that that's so very difficult to do. Whereas I think in, say in Beckett, um, it's something else, which I don't want to try and summarize in one sentence, but something like there isn't a thing or the kind of thing there is is not the kind of thing at all that you thought there might be. Um, a very, very crude way of reason why I think that, and I have no idea if this is justifiable, is that I think if you if you took someone with no exposure to the 20th century tradition to see Beckett, they would find it hard to engage with. Where I think if you took anyone to see Bacon, there's a, a viscerality to it that I think anyone can engage with. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting. And I mean, I, I like that essay on Spengler. Generally, I think philosophy would be better if more people bothered to engage with Spengler. Um, so, yeah, I need to, I need to think about Adorno. That's, that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just see hands up again for questions? Anyone else? Do I've answered them all. <laughs> Actually, I had a question for you about your, uh, if, uh, do you have a question? No, no, you go, you go first. I'll save mine for the end. So, uh, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I really can relate to many, many things that you uh, said, and uh, I think uh, already to start with this idea of tension, which I really think it's important. I mean, he's stressing it all the time, and I think it is often get is disappeared precisely in this kind of a game of playing body against reason, or this uh, that, that this kind of oppositions are in fact not what he's all about, and that there is something about this tension that it's precisely out of this kind of uh, duality or, or dialectics. And I was just now, this is really a total improvisation, but uh, in relationship to this uh, last quote that you are, uh, that you put on the board, um, it seems to me, you know, almost, I mean, okay, I'm here biased with my Lacanian, whatever perspective, um, but it seems to me that first of all, um, I would say this talk of mortality and of fin finitude and of body as kind of reminding us of our finitude and sensations uh, as well, that this is really just not even perhaps one side of the story because I'm really deeply convinced that uh, what is the kind of uh, uh, ordeal, let's say, of human existence, uh, existence, it's not simply that we are finite beings and that we will die and our exposure, exposure to mortality, but rather what I formulated at some point, like we are not even finite. There is a leak in this finitude. And this leak in this finitude is precisely, perhaps in this sense, the nervous system that gets overexcited, even if there is no reason for it to 
kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> embrace. So there is, I mean, I related this to these more Lacanian notions of the dead drive or the, of uh, jouissance and so on. But I think that uh, if we were just finite, uh, I don't even know why we would not simply kind of, the, the problem is that something is kind of ripping us from the thin as we are alive, it's not simply that once we will die. It is something that takes place simultaneously. While we are mortal, there is a certain kind of, um, perhaps not infinitude, but something not completely finite that goes on at the same time. And I'm kind of tempted to 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 read this uh, um, in this uh, in this passage that you uh, that you, and. The, Okay, another question is uh, more, this is not even a question, it's more a suggestion because you presented phenomenology as the, the way precisely to get to the things as they are and you really nicely, I think I, I, I agree with this, I definitely think that he is someone who is very much subscribed to objective uh, realist ontology, so to say. Uh, but I, again, I have here a kind of a, a Lacanian bias and I would almost say that uh, it is only a subject in this really strictly Lacanian sense, not individual or whatever subjectivity or in its purest that can register things as they really are. <laughs> not brackets them like, okay, this is a standard uh, phenomenological procedure, but that there is a blind spot in the reality which is called, which is called the subject. And it's only this blind spot that actually kind of can capture things as they really are. Whether if you just take subjects to be something subjective, something that one needs to get rid of in order to get to the pure uh, undisturbed reality, you actually deprive yourself of the very means of getting to the yeah. uh, to this real. So this is just, uh, but this is not a uh, comment. No, no, I really liked your talk and thank you. No, th thank you. That's, that's, so I agree with that completely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, generally for me, the subject is the access to the objective, right? If you have no, I think about, as I see you now, I see you from a particular place, okay? And I could see you from better and worse places, okay? So if I crawl under that table, I will see you less well. And so the challenge is to get in the position where I can best see you. But that's not the same as the position I would best see you from is no position at all, okay? As if to think that somehow if I, if I wasn't here, but I wasn't there either, I was somewhere nowhere, that would be the best view of all. Because of course that would be no view of any kind. So the subject is the opening onto the real, um, but there may nevertheless then be better and worse openings for that subject. And that's of course why you need the method, right? If the, it was simply that the subject is expressive and the subject can, it's about emptying oneself onto the canvas, then he could just chuck the paint, do whatever, which what Bacon's trying to express, I think particularly in the Sylvester interviews, Bourse elsewhere is, there's got to be this immensely disciplined method. Why? get the thing, to capture the thing as it is, right? Um, and I, I think that's interesting in relation to other people who can't force say Bataille, and Bataille also always stresses there's going to be this incredibly disciplined method to what may seem like purely mad practice, right? Because if it were purely mad, it would become purely random. If it were purely random, it wouldn't be tracking the thing it's trying to track. Um, on the infinity point, so I think that's interesting. And I, 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 it's complex, it ties up with the ontology. So I think there is definitely an infinitist dimension in Bacon because the thing that he's trying to track is some kind of um, perceptual sensory universal. So I think when he's trying to track exhilarated despair, that is a thing that all of us could encounter. It's not a mental state that only I have in the same way that I have now a pain in my left hand that you don't have. It's a mental type that we can all encounter and that's what he's trying to access. And that gives some notion of infinity. It's not confined to my experience with yours. It's available to all of us. Um, but I think to say more on that when you talk about the relation between infinity and universality. Um, yeah, yeah. I think also, oh, just, sorry, just one last thing that's, uh, that's very helpful question is very thinkable. It's interesting that the relation between birth and death here doesn't prompt radical decisions. So see how different this is from existentialism. So in existentialism, you think about your own death and you go and do something radical the next day. Whereas here, he's always conscious of it. It's there all the time. And it's the basis of his practice every single day. It's not a kind of Sartrean, I've thought about death, now I'm going to go and throw my lot with resistance or whatever. And of course, again, that's a caricature of Sartre, but you can miss the point. But yeah, thank you.
Any other questions? Great. Hello. Thank you for a really Hello. insightful um, talk. So I appreciate that um, Bacon's consciousness of life and death and mortality comes through in his paintings. And that's why it could be argued that he's he's not decadent because the balance it, within him is more on the favour of, oh, we're going to die, mortality. I'm not optimistic, right? But if it's his ultimate, if ultimately his intention is to trigger reaction in the person viewing his paintings with his, you know, shocking choices of themes, all of that, couldn't it be argued that he is an optimist, even if it's vicariously? Because if the index of, you know, like you said earlier, is is by reference to the triggering of an emotion when you when you view a painting, surely that makes him an optimist because that's his intention. He's trying to trigger that um, that nervous system in the viewer. He's indulging in that. Couldn't it be argued he's a decadent when you view it like that? Yeah, it, it could be, but that's why I don't, that's that's what I don't want to do. But because because you're right, you can make that move. So I, I, I won't say he's not a decadent, um, because if you think he's trying to trigger sensations in the viewer, that becomes the pater model. The point is about what jolts, what shocks can I give people? I've made like a shocky machine. Come and get strapped into my shocky machine, I'll give you some shocks. I think that would then make him a decadent. That would make him very like pater. It would be about what are the feelings, the sensations I can get? And that would create all the classic decadent problems. What happens when the shocks wear off? Like if I've seen lots of bacon, what's special about art? Why can't I get the shocks from drugs? Why can't I get the shocks from sex? Um, and those are all the problems decadents have. I want to say he's not a decadent because I think he's not doing that. Um, and I'm sorry that if that, that wasn't, I uh, didn't come across well. Um, because I think what he's doing instead is trying to track certain objects. He's trying to track certain facts um, and whether the viewer responds in a certain way or not is not really the point. It's just that sometimes the shocks are a good indication of whether he's on the right path. So like when you're giving a, a talk, um, the, point of, the point of giving a talk is, is not to make the audience laugh. Like if I wanted to make you laugh, I wouldn't, really, I wouldn't have given this talk. I wouldn't have given it um, so the point of giving the talk is not to make the audience laugh. But at the same time, if the audience is kind of looking slightly engaged, that's a good sign. But that's not because it's my aim, it's because it's, suggest that I'm doing okay on my other aim, namely conveying certain information or something like that. So I don't think he wants to trigger reactions to the audience. I think he wants to map reality. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. But, but you're, you're exactly right, because as you very eloquently put it, if I thought he was about triggering sensations, then by my standards, he would be a decadent. You're right, that's absolutely right. I'm dead, but that's what I want to avoid. But was he conscious that you, you could get to the point of jadedness. You could argue that he kept trying to trigger, kept trying to trigger, because yeah. most of his work's shocking, right? So even though the, you know, the, the, the Bacon fan will just get used to yeah. his dark work, yeah. if he kept trying, you could say that he's, he's decadent because it's, it's, it's his intention. Yeah you, so yeah. yeah, you could do, you could do, but I don't want to say that. I mean, it may be, you may be right, but I don't want to say that because that makes the project, I think, it kind of cheapens the project because what he's trying to do is basically scare people again and again. And the problem is they've seen the scary movies, they're not scared. And he has to, you know, it's like Saw 17, he has to keep upping the ante. And that seems, I think that cheapens it because I think um, it makes it all about the audience. It makes it all about manipulating the audience. It traps you in this need to keep increasing the scariness, which is impossible. Um, and it means there's no reason why art as opposed to drugs is the, the media. Whereas I think what he's trying to do is something different. He's trying to represent parts of reality. And the fact that it shocks or scares you may indicate that he's done it well, but it's not the aim. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Thank Thanks. You. There was a question over here to the left and then one of front. We'll do this lady first and then we'll come back to you. Is there anyone else, just so I know? Is anyone got a question? Thank you very much for a very rich talk. It's really interesting. Um, it's a thought that's been troubling me and I think it's maybe it's for all the speakers in some way. I'd really like to better understand this idea that thinking about um, Bacon in the context of his life story is unhelpful. Because if I've understood the arguments correctly, I think we've heard the argument that 
it might be because he doesn't desire that, that he says, I am, um, you know, I, I hate the idea that my story might be understood. I don't want to be thought about in that way. And to that, I'd think, well, sorry, does the unconscious know that level of negation? But um, also that perhaps the, an idea comes across that it's not interesting or that it's not where you're really going to find the truth of what he can offer in his work. And I, I just wondered if you could share some thoughts to help, help me and perhaps others better understand this idea that we might make, um, create ideas and theories about what his intentions are, but that this is helpful to do away from his autobiography. I just wanted to understand yeah. that. Thank you. No, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. Because of course, there's an, a really strong tendency to go to the autobiography, right? You know, when we're trying to understand anyone, um, where are you coming from? I, like, what's your story? And then I can understand more about the work you've done. So, um, so why don't I want to do that? Um, because I don't think it speaks to what's distinctive about the work. So if you think, suppose um, I said, I mean, obviously I can't summarize all Bacon's life here, but suppose a Bacon led a, um, a, a rich and conflicted life involving um, lots of uh, tormented and um, uh, deeply passionate uh, sexual liaisons and lots of alcohol. Okay, so I mean, obviously that's an absurd summary, but you know, if I were to summarize it like that. Um, so the reason I don't think that's very helpful is there are lots of people who lead lives like that, um, but who don't produce any work, any paintings, any any art books, any philosophy, any theory. But loads of people who lead lives like that. Now it may be interesting to understand those people if you're married to them, if they're your family or whatever, if you're a, a, a psychiatrist who's trying to aid them, if you want to write a book about the cultural phenomena. But it seems that it, since that can exist without any work being produced, that that's not the best way to understand the work. I guess another way to think about it is that um, if that were the best way to understand the work, I wouldn't need to look at any of the paintings. If I just sat down with Bacon and got him to tell me about his childhood or <coughs> went through the hotel receipts or whatever, then I could know what kind of life he led. And I wouldn't need to engage with any of the, the I think the more challenging questions that are in the, in the paintings. So it seems to be a kind of shortcut, but a shortcut to less interesting places. I guess you want to put it in terms of decadence. If decadence is living a kind of debauched life of, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, there are lots of people who do that. And they're not artists, or at least most of them aren't. And similarly, there are lots of artists who create works that speak to these themes, but who live immensely disciplined and quiet um, lives that don't display any trace of this stuff. I mean, there's a famous Flaubert quote, that you have to be very disciplined and organized in your life to be disruptive in your work. So I think the, the relationship between the artist and the work is just too complicated to, um, to make it fruitful, um, to go down that path. Uh, and you know, there's some, there's some artists in the broader sense whose life is simply of no interest. Um, and someone like Kant is a famous case, right? So Kant never leaves the town he's born in, he does the same thing every day, eats the same thing, he talks to the same people. Um, but obviously that's not, that doesn't matter for understanding Kant terribly. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, I mean, I think there are interesting cases. I think there are cases where people use parts of their biography to give cover or support to parts of their work. Um, so Deleuze is an interesting case here. I think we don't take, we don't read Deleuze in the way we do if we don't know Deleuze's backstory. Um, I think it gives it a kind of authenticity and authority that it wouldn't otherwise have. And then, of course, there's other, I think, clearer cases where it's um, something in their life that you think then is visible in the work that you wouldn't otherwise have seen. So it may be that um, you find out, for example, they held enormously fascist political opinions, and then you think you can see that in the work when you wouldn't have noticed it before. But what's important for me is, is it ultimately has to come back to the work. Do you see it in the work or not? If there are cases where they held enormously fascist political opinions, but you can't find any trace of it in the work, I'm less interested in the purely biographical play. Um, I mean, it's all much more complicated than that because this whole idea of bleeding into the work is very complicated. Um, you know, as, as, your, as your question indicates. So, yeah, and it, it's complicated as well because it links up with issues about changing moralities. You know, do we care about artists committing immoral acts? Um, but that's basically why I don't think it's important. It doesn't get to the heart of the work. I think we have time for one final question. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment really um, in support of, I suppose, a re-emphasis um, away from the shock function towards the recording function. Um, and just to su su suggest in mitigation for that kind of count is, we've talked about it already today in, 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 in uh, Danny's paper earlier about um, Bacon's absence of models. And when he's talking about this at numerous points in the interviews, and he talks about it at one point because he tried to paint Sylvester from you know, him being present in the studio. And he says it didn't work because it made Sylvester profoundly uncomfortable because he was shocked by the fact that at a certain point, Bacon pulled out photographs of close-ups of rhino skin uh, when he was painting his portrait. And he sort of said that, you know, that, that, that in a way, it mitigates you know, your, your, your observation that the intention here um, is not simply to shock and, uh, and disrupt, but goes towards this other function that you're talking about, which is that, in some sense, him bringing out photographs of rhino skin um, and, and, and in an effort to sort of coagulate and create a kind of thickness in, in, in the portrait is actually much more to do with a recording function than it is about kind of this, you know, um, you know the, the novelty and the shock of producing, you know, a kind of portrait that is kind of uh, profoundly disruptive. Um, it's, again, it's actually as part of an effort towards realism. Yeah, yeah, so that, that, thank you, that's a helpful way of putting it. That's exactly what I want to say. Um, that's much better said than I did, but yeah, that's 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 what I want to say. Um, and and that seems to be so phenomenology, right? So the basic phenomenological idea is to do something really simple is really hard. To describe the thing that's in front of you now is much, much harder than you thought it was going to be. And because of that, you need all these incredibly complicated methods to disrupt your ordinary way of seeing it. And that seems to be what's happening here. Um, and it just so happens that because we're so used to the ordinary way of seeing it, those methods and their results seem shocking in the same way that being in time gives a description of the world that doesn't seem like the world we know. But the point is not a shock. The point is to tell you something about the world as it is. It's to Zach as Alps, it's to tell you about the thing as it is in itself. But yeah, thank you. That's, that's a really good way of putting it. I might, if I ever write this up, I might plagiarize that. Um, that brings us very neatly to 120. Do you want to do the lunch? Do you want to take one more question or do you want no, to? No, no, I sorry, I was just going to re I was going to switch my personas to um, to organizer. Just um, Are you gonna disrupt lunch? <laughs> I, I'm gonna, no, simply to say that um, as Vanessa says, lunch is indeed here. Um, we'll start again at quarter past two. There's masses of food, bathroom out there, turn right on your left. If you want to go outside. Um, you go along the corridor and then down the stone staircases. And you can get out of the kind of courtyard where you can have a city or whatever. There's a coffee and so forth sold out there. Um, anything else? No, that's oh, fine. Brilliant. Wear sunscreen if you're going Wear out. Sunscreen. Wear sunscreen. Fantastic. Thank you.